the first thing I want to do is really clarify what we mean. We say API, and perhaps you guys already know it stands for Application Programming Interface. But what I want to emphasize is that's the thing that you talk to instead of talking directly to Marquette. It's a common misunderstanding that an API means you have this deep, like, I don't know, uh, entry into the entrails of Marketo and you can do anything you want. It's actually the opposite in a way. Anytime there's an API, that means there's a layer in front of the backend platform. It means there's a layer in front of the databases. You can't get directly to the databases. And as my colleague Brian is in the back there, knows very well, uh, we often deal with people who don't understand that. They think, oh, there's an API, we can do anything we want. Um, there's even sort of, I don't know if the name has come up yet, but there should be a new name for that. Uh, that business book way, you know, you get the naysayer, the backstabber, and the people in the office and stuff like that. Whatever that name should be, it's like the person who thinks APIs do everything. That's like a new bad <laughs> name. But I, I keep meeting them. And, you know, it's, 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 it makes sense because in the past, we neither had an API nor any other kind of access. So they often think, well, that means you can do anything. Um, this sounds like a fake story, but it is true. Um, uh, actually, that same person back there, Brian and I, uh, put together a web app a very, very long time ago that's still running and kind of has an API, sort of. And someone reached out to me uh, the other day. It's not related to Marketo, by the way, at all. It's like an ops product for manufacturing. Um, and someone found me online. We never get any new clients anymore, which is fine, because that's like a dead product. But she said, do you have an open API? I want to integrate with my new startup platform. And I was like, I don't really know how to answer the question, because we have an export API, I meaning you can get stuff out, but we turned off the import API because it was like impossible to maintain, no one knew how to use it, but people were too junior to know how to use it, so and I was like, that's the junction point. If I say, yeah, she's gonna say, oh, you can do anything I want, but I actually said no, I decided to round down to no, because even though you can export to XML, JSON, or whatever, that's not really enough. But bear that in mind, when, when anybody, not just Marketo, uh, tells you they have an API, they could mean they have one function you can do that lets you get all the way or part of the way into the backend. That's it. That's all it takes to have an API. So, um, and that's where some of my, well, let's call it creative skepticism will come in and, uh, as we go on. And I guess I have a little highlight here. Oops, I have to unlock my phone. No. Um, right. Just highlighting again. It's instead of talking directly. It doesn't mean you can get at anything. And APIs in many ways are defined by their limitations. Not by what they can do, but what they can't do and how they dash your hopes in every way until you find a cool way to use it. So again, they're not direct connections into Marketo. Uh, quite the opposite. In the old days, as I'll show you in a few slides, there used to be such a thing as a direct connection into a remote system that you pay for. No one really does that anymore, preferring this layer in front, but uh, there are consequences to that as well. So it is what we call abstractions of an internal system for public, meaning authenticated public consumption over the, over the internet, but still public, as opposed to inside the company. You can't do what Marketo can do with its in-house in databases. I've seen those databases a little bit, and it's clear that they can do uh, way more, and they're used in, 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 a, in a way far more sophisticated than we can ever use. Doesn't mean we can't do some cool stuff, but just want to kind of hammer on that point just because you embark on an API project doesn't mean all of a sudden everything will be on Earth. The good thing is uh, the API is well documented. The bad thing is there's nothing that's not in the documentation that it secretly does, right? That's the way it always is with any API. It's not like, oh, I bet there is an endpoint. Uh, no, I really, it's not in the documentation. There's no such thing. Um, in many ways here, by the way, I'm talking about the REST API, which is going to be the last of the APIs that I talk about today. Um, that's the RESTful HTTP API. I'm actually going to kind of tunnel our way into there through the other APIs, what I consider the other APIs, that are to me in a lot of, a lot of ways more exciting. But um, so that's, yeah, the REST API uh, best encompasses the idea of an abstraction, a layer, a reduced surface area, and all this. So I'm just saying it always abstracts, meaning it always creates a different language from what the internal people are using. Um, almost never offers a full superset of what you can do via the UI. Common confusion with Marketo is people think, well, it has an API, that means it must have some new feature, some stuff you can't do interactively, but some stuff like extract a report, um, you know, uh, look at a smart list exactly as it looks at any point in time, maintain smart campaigns. No way, we'll see in a moment what we can and can't do. That stuff is not exposed at all because, like most platforms, the idea is to create uh, more techy oriented more code-oriented 
uh, programmatic ways of accessing data, but not to make that a superset of everything you could do. In fact, in some ways, that means you can't build your own Marketo on top of Marketo's uh, API. And that's, that's kind of okay, because then you could compete with them and all kinds of other things for that. It would be great if you could see everything in the UI and more, but you can't. So almost never can we see a superset. It's usually uh, a subset, and we see that here in a very strong way with Marketo. Even as the APIs are all evolving, they are really not even close to what you can do in the UI, but just to be on the positive side, we're gonna learn some things you can do via the APIs that you can't do any other way. But again, don't think it must be everything you get when you log in and more. It's in many ways much, much less, except for some highlights of awesome stuff. Uh, I guess I just said that again, right? Um, sometimes, I'll just give you an example, So, because I haven't had any details yet. For example, I don't know if you guys know this, you can do an API-based list import into Marketo and dedupe on the lead ID. Who knew that? Anybody? Okay. Someone pretend they do it. Anyway, um, unlike when you do a UI-based list import which always dedupes on email address, if you use the API to do seemingly the same thing, you get a choice of deduping on ID and email address, which is awesome if you're changing email addresses, which is incredible if you're trying to do things where the only key you have is the ID. Maybe you don't have an email address. Maybe you just have a phone number. So um, really kind of a, a, a great example of when <coughs> there is something that shines out in the API. Yes? Uh, any example of tools you can think of that use that to their advantage? Like if I came across like an integration where it's like, oh, how do you do that? that would be um, I would say it's a good question. I think that most sophisticated like sort of commercial integrations are aware of that, maybe to a fault, because they don't know about the difference between Deduping on email, deduping on ID, deduping on another custom field. It seems like something I might have, a slide I might have left out, but I'll try to get to that as well. A lot of times, well, let's call it all the time, the people running commercial integrations, um, not like you know you guys here at NewsGrid, but um, running commercial integration platforms don't really know how Marketo works. So that's why they think it can do everything because they're, they're assuming that everything it can do is everything the API can do. And here we know, as all people who have some degree of fluency, in the UI, it's not even close. So, but that's a good question. I mean, I, I think I think certainly they think you only can dedupe on ID is probably more likely than deduping on email. And then we have the other confusion of is the email the primary key in Marketo, which it's not, even though constantly people think it is. So again, you don't know that unless you're a Marketo user. So you'd probably be like, what does that even mean as an integration architect? And again, that's where some of my complaints come in about people trying to use the API without knowing how to use Marketo itself. I'm really afraid my phone's going to go to sleep, but it doesn't. Um, and again, uh, here I mentioned that we commonly use an industry standard format for input and output. That can be as simple as a CSV or a JSON, if any of you are familiar with that. If you're, well, how many people here would consider yourself to be coders or code capable? Maybe that's a question. Good. good, good. All right. That's a healthy, I like that way. Healthy enough number, because I don't want to alienate people and, you know, some of what I'm doing today is, is, is hopefully teaching you guys how to deal with people that build integrations as well as building integrations yourselves. So for those who are coders, it's for you to learn, and coders also evaluate other people's work, and also for people who just purchase such things. Um, it's for you guys to know what some of the, the dangers are. Um, so I talk about a format like JSON, XML, MIME. MIME is used in the asset API. It's a way of transferring static files, for example. Form URL encoding is the same encoding that we see on the web whenever we post a form. So these are very common formats, unlike, for example, what Marketo is using internally, or what anyone's using internally to query these databases, they're using uh, like the MySQL line protocol, or to some degree at least, uh, SQL Server TDS protocol, things that are proprietary, or at the very least very complex. These are uh, generally text-based or text-like, like easy things. It's another way of abstracting it and saying, you know, don't be too scared. There's nothing, um, you know, too elusive about using the API. Uh, now my slides really look redundant. Um, <laughs> protecting the database. That's what happens when you do it all to it before. Um, as I mentioned, a fraction of the performance of, inter of internal resources. Now, let me tell you, you can do 100,000, maybe, if you pay for it, 100,000 API calls to the Marketo REST API per day. You could do billions maybe even close to trillions of queries against their back-end database if you had direct access to the back-end database. Proof again, not that I need to rub it in, you're not really getting entry to the back. You are, you are very much um, 
passing through a layer for security purposes, to protect you, let's say, protect the integrity of the back end. Um, and, and, and that's really kind of notable. The, the very low API limits, as well, again, I'll get to that, um, very low API, uh, API limits with Marketo, given how large some databases are, right? SFDC, um, the same organization connected with Marketo, says the SFDC org might get a million calls per day. Marketo would get 50,000 to 100,000, depending on what you pay for. Uh, even a couple of years ago, you only got 10,000. So it's really kind of an incredible throttle. That again, means you have to be more intelligent with your architecture. You have to know what, what you can do, and that you, if you have to do it 200,000 times a day, you can't do it. So you have to reduce what your, uh, what your goals are. So now yeah, the caps, exactly. Now here's a good thing, that, and, and I do mean this honestly. Um, the fact that APIs are limited or defined by their limitations means that if someone comes in and says they have a Marketo integration, you know exactly what they're playing with. You know that you can go on the public API docs with probably one exception that I'll mention in a moment. You know what they're programming against. So when they start saying they can do things that you know can't be done, that gives you that makes you the great firewall against a kind of shifty salesperson. Um, uh, we've had people come in and say with SFDC the same kind of thing. Oh, we've got a native connector that's going under the service. But what kind of native connector could that be? Salesforce prides itself on its open API. It can't possibly be true. Eventually, you whittle it away, and you find out they were lying. The same thing could clearly happen here, and a lot of it with Marketo comes from people not understanding what uh, Marketo really does as a UI, right? They're not marketers, they're not market automation people, so when they pitch you the thing, they're basically thinking that all you can do is what you can do in the APIs. You get this kind of weird cyclical reasoning. Anyway, um, in, in all seriousness, there is a positive aspect here, and that's why it's good for anyone, even a non-coder, to kind of learn what the API can do, because someone's going to come in and tell you it can do something else, and okay? you want to know better. I'm skipping very fast past this slide, but I can't really avoid it. Oops, there we go. I guess I did skip it. It was real later if someone wants, I can show them that secret slide. Um, so not the only way. I mean, I have this fake sketch here. I don't know if it, what you guys can see using my simple diagrams, fake sketch diagram. I wanted to show you guys that APIs are just kind of a newish way to connect to an internal service you know, offered by a, a provider. In the old days, which is on the left side, in the old days, you'd get like a VPN or maybe you'd be restricted by IP, and you might have direct SQL access to the backend database, which is exactly what you don't have with an API. So um, I don't know if anyone here has really been doing this work for as long as I have, maybe a few of you, but we definitely still, in some cases, <laughs> have, have it, sometimes in, in finance, curiously enough, you might instead of like a private VPN link, and then you get direct access, right, Ryan? Like DB2 access to provide like, you know, crazy flexibility. It's awesome, but that's not an API. It's deeper than an API can ever be. And the new side, I just, I don't know if any of this can be read, but um, I'm saying now, instead we do public access, usually over, over the internet with SSL and, uh, you know, OAuth authentication or something like that. Specific APIs are exposed and only that. And then you've got the internal database. Some people inside, like at Marketo, for example, are still doing direct traffic to the database. In other cases, um, inside they're doing what we used to call, I don't know if this term is still used, eating your own dog food, which I guess means you use your own API. So in other cases, so in, you know, it's companies like Amazon, uh, more cutting edge companies, um, they will build an API internally and sort of prohibit connecting directly to databases, always creating a layered approach for security protection and so on. Do you have a question? Yeah. Does anyone have a question? Does that leave around that? No. Um, <coughs> seriously, if anyone raises their hand, all the better. Um, and again, driving the point home again, it's just a port. It's not like you're, this is supposed to be tinkering with the motherboard with a pair of forceps or whatever. That's, that's not what you're doing with an API. Um, and so if the API doesn't have a connector, you don't have the matching cable or whatever ridiculous uh, cliche I'm trying to go for, that would be true. Um, there's a saying in programming that, that some of you might have heard of your coders, which is program to the interface. Program to the interface, not the implementation, is the long way. And that means you basically code as if you don't know what's behind the API. You don't care about that, you only care about what the API says it can do, what the Marketo docs said it can do, Salesforce docs, whatever you're using, and you don't care about what's behind that. Now, there's a problem. 
And the reason that I said that it doesn't quite work is that if you don't know what's behind it, you don't know the meaning of anything, you don't know the business use of any of these tools. So actually, I think that this concept, while it's like a computer science concept or whatever, doesn't really work with stuff like Marketo. You do this, and that's how you get a really bad integration because nobody knows. What, you act like you don't know what's behind it, and you're just like, oh, uh, I guess I'll do the lead activity update or something like that. You don't know what those words mean. You know, I've talked to integrators who ask me what tokens are, who ask me what snippets are, who ask me what assets are. Um, you know, again, a wide world of things that are not understood. So um, I only mention this, although, you know, I don't know what good it does because if you knew it, you knew it already. But, um, that program to the interface doesn't really work with Marketo, and that's why when you're building an integration, you need to be, or at least have at your right hand, a really experienced Marketo user, end user, person who's you know, building campaigns, uh, knows how to do you know, nurture programs up and down, can tell you all the terminology. They, they may not really know what, what you're trying to do, but if you don't communicate with that person, uh, it's, it's, it's bad news. So, here we go. You see some names for groupings of APIs that are my own nomenclature, not exactly the same as the Marketo documentation has it. Um, but I think these groupings make sense for me. Uh, so I'm going to make them make sense for you. So we have the client APIs, which are the Munchkin API, the Forms.js API, um, which, by the way, is not the same as the Form Asset API. That's another story we'll get to if I ever finish today. The Inflow APIs what I call them, the Webhook API and the Velocity API. Is Velocity an API? Absolutely, this I'll prove it to you. Uh, and the Webhook API absolutely is, is Marketo's outbound API that, that runs in a flow, just like Velocity runs during the, sent, during the assembly uh, of an email, which is, in a sense, part of the flow. I call these the inflow APIs. Um, Munchkin API and the Forms.js API are browser-based. Those are the client APIs. Um, Anybody super attentive here will notice that I left some out, whether because of laziness or fake intent. But the idea is that I call um, the object APIs, I include the Marketo Opportunity Company Salesperson APIs and the object APIs. I don't know if any of you guys have even used those. They don't work if you're using SFTC, by the way, but they're kind of cool to try to work if you don't have a CRM. Um, so those are the, yeah, the opportunity company. And then uh, Marketo Custom Objects, which do work uh, regardless of whether you have a CRM. And some of you are probably using them, some of you are probably wondering, are they a good idea? And it depends. Um, and then the lead crud, meaning um, you know, uh, create, read, update, delete um, on leads. Um, that also applies to a few other areas, but those are kind of what I call the object APIs. Let's think of them as one by one updates. Even though some of them are capable of bulk updates, let's call them one by one updates to distinguish from here the bulk and bulk ish APIs. Um, for bulk activity extract, which you can do um, you know, monthly, a giant file and import into your data warehouse, which is probably my favorite of the backend APIs right now, simply because it does exactly what it is you know, advertised as doing. It's, at least now that they've changed it from 30 days to 31 days. Nice one. And yes, that was real. But anyway, 30, you can do a, a month of activity extract, which is awesome. Um, the activity export, which is kind of a uh, Another way of getting at the same data, um, I'll describe the, the differences later, but these are all bulk based. And of course, the bulk lead import, um, which as I mentioned just a moment ago, is how you can dedupe an ID, something you can't do via the UI. Um, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Pretend one. No, not intentionally, but I do have. OK, good. 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 Someone, please. Go ahead. Save me. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, the asset APIs, how long have they been around? Were they rudimentary for a very extended period of time, or are they somewhat? Well, like, you guys are using them. Well, actually, you're using the snippet, which technically would be yeah, an asset API. Which is um, a my own getting, curiosity. Yeah, they haven't evolved too much since they first were rolled out. I, I think the static files API is great. That's how you can asset uh, you can uh, update, for example, JPEGs or PDFs in the design studio. So not not dynamic market assets, but static assets. And so it does, again, the question for me sometimes is, does the API do everything it claims to do? Static Files API absolutely does everything it claims to do, because it's just saying you can create a way of uploading from you know, your Adobe app or whatever else you're using. You could, I didn't say anyone had created it, but you could create, using the API, uh, a way of uploading static files, images, and PDFs, and so on. Um, yeah, but I think those are pretty sophisticated. I, I, I'll get into this later. I have questions about whether these are useful for anyone. 
not building a what I call a template as a service platform. The people that do that, that are selling templates and want to push templates and assets and anything else to you know 100 clients, they're perfect for that. For you to build it for your own use, I I don't know. But again, it's knowing what you know what, what you can and can't do. So here's what we don't have in Marketo. A lot of times people assume API means everything's an API, everything's exposed. So I struck them through open so read them. We don't have a user interface API. That means we can't customize menus and buttons. We can't officially, um, in any supported way, add uh, you know, color drop downs or change the widgets that we use in the UI. Marketo Sky is going to be changing drastically the default widgets, but as far as I know, even though people have said otherwise, it's still not going to be programmable. So basically that change gets thrust upon you. And uh, unlike even in something like you know, Microsoft Word or something like that, which has had customizable menus for whatever, 30 years, however long it's existed, um, you still, you know, in a lot of platforms, it's not just Marketo, in a lot of platforms you don't get that, but obviously if Salesforce is your specialty, you know you can do it in Salesforce, so it kind of drive you a little crazy that you don't have those custom layout abilities to change the interaction in that way. We don't have a reporting API, and that sucks, because <laughs> yes. a reporting API would mean you could define the report, and then you could download the results of the report programmatically. It's like everybody's dream. Well, that's did they, anybody, use, did they used to, Sandy, and then shut it down? Or were they always? I, I just feel like back in the day, you used to be able to do, or maybe they just never allowed you to do it. I don't. Before, I don't like, anyone else, cycle. anyone else who's been doing it longer than I have? I don't, know. Have an idea? I don't, think, I don't think it ever did that. Um, I've struggled recently with, and again, knowing what you have and what you don't have is very good. So I, I keep comparing to Salesforce. I'm not really a Salesforce expert, but I use the API a bit, so I know the contrast. Salesforce does have a reporting API. Has anyone used the reporting API in Salesforce at all? No. Programmatically download a uh, 2,000 row limit? That's the problem. So what's better? Having, having an API that can do everything but truncates you at 2,000 rows or not having the API at all? I would almost venture that where we are right now, as bad as it is, is better. And I want Marketo at some point to build a reporting API that, you know, within sensible limits, would let you download a giant report. 2,000 rows is, has no meaning to me. And I think that Salesforce is, you know, on their side, they'd be like, reporting API, and you actually use it. Um, it's extremely disappointing. We don't have a forms preprocessor API, which might seem kind of elusive to you guys, but has anyone ever tried to plug in reCAPTCHA or other form validation yes. things into it? Yeah? OK. So you know, the, you, you know the problem I'm getting at here is you can't stop the form from going into Marketo before you validate the contents, which in many ways just completely subverts the idea of validating uh, the fields. So other, you know, my ideal platform, because I use the forms JavaScript API so much, is to have this exist. I know it's never going to exist. It's just not on the roadmap. But it would be great because that could mean that you could pre-screen stuff on the server. So even if a hacker is getting in or a bot is trying to storm you know, into your server, you could stop it before it gets into Marketo and stay now if you rolled out recapture, you know what I mean. You roll out recapture, it works, but you first have to accept the lead into your DB, then check to see if it passed recapture, then check to see if someone like impersonated someone else who might have not passed recapture, and then like quarantine it and then delete it. So it does work, but in the interim, you've got maybe, you know, 10,000 or maybe a million extra leads as you delete. Yes? Question? No, just nodding. I love nodding. <laughs> love nodding. Um, thank you. Um, but uh, that's good to know that you guys agree. So yeah, that would be great. And uh, validation of form fields also. In case anybody here doesn't realize what I mean, you can validate form fields in the browser only if someone is not malicious. And that doesn't mean it doesn't work. I need, let's guess, 95% of the time? The other 5% of the time, someone wants to bypass your validation rules, it's a no-brainer. And because we don't have this API, we can't check to see if their input is actually valid before it gets into Marketo. All we can do is, um, you know, block fields from updates and try to check stuff and use proxy fields. And again, a whole lot of junk that's fun to think about but would be solved if we had this. Um, we don't have a campaign update API. Um, there is a smart list API now that can get the results of the smart list, but you can't change and reorder stuff. I don't know whether that's a huge thing that's missing, but a lot of people think it exists. So I just want to point that out. They figure, again, 
API must mean I can go in and change stuff that's in the UI. Not that stuff that's in the UI. Some stuff that's in the UI, but not that. And stupid joke. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, yeah. Sandy, have you ever used the man tools? I think it yeah. might use some IP reporting, but I'm not sure it's just popular. Mm -hmm. Maybe. I used it, but not against anything like that. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Show me what you check out. Yeah. Um, this is the most humble bragging thing ever. But I wanted to show you that I built this hack on top of the non-customizable landing page, uh, non-API, non-API. This is just a landing page editor. I put this this uh, palette of different colors in here, and I made these into dropdowns, and that's really great. But as soon as Marketo comes out with Sky permanently, this is going to be just completely mangled and non-existent. And the client uh, or clients that I built it for are going to come to me screaming and say, why did you do something that wasn't actually using the UI? And I'll say, well, I kind of warned you a little bit that it was a hack. But this is a good example of what you shouldn't do anymore. If you're reverse engineering something, it's not an API. That's a, another kind of confusion. People say, like, they watch the the packets that the Marketo UI sends to the Marketo servers. They're like, I think I've reverse engineered their API. You, you, didn't, you didn't do anything like that. You watch how it looks now. Maybe you could build a Chrome extension. Someone, a very ambitious and skilled person, built a Chrome extension um, last year. That, uh, I hope that person was here in Madison. But a uh, Chrome extension that, is it you? Me? Oh, okay. Ah. Uh, that, uh, a, Chrome, that, a, a Chrome extension that can enhance the UI. But it's only based on the UI continuing to have exactly the same look. Marketo's not obligated to you to tell you that they changed uh, how the UI works and what kind of JavaScript it uses and what requests it makes to the server. So I've committed this sin enough to know that I think it's done. If we can't put pressure on Marketo to give us uh, a UI customization API, we can't rely on things like this, like this happening. Um, I, I thought that Marketo Sky would never come out, so I was like, all right, I'm going to be fine. But um, it, it is seriously going to break, um, you know, three of my clients that are using this thing, and I'm going to say, I can't, I can't just do it again. You know, new hack for Sky. Like, it's not going to happen. Um, so let's not say that we if, we, if you have to figure out what an API is, it's not really an API. It should always be published, and documented. Um, so Marketo, we have uh, just to kind of scan down here. Um, the client APIs, which I will continue to emphasize, are designed for scale in a way that. At least these three are definitely not designed for. What do I mean by scale? I mean that you can use the Munchkin API millions and millions of times per day without having a problem. The Forms JS API is designed to be used millions of times per day. So when you make those customizations on a form, you can be assured that it will continue to work even if a hacker discovers your site, gets really mad at you, or you just have a really successful campaign, and so on. And that's really important for me because I'm like a security and back end person, as you might have if you read my stuff on the on the community, you know that uh, I think a lot about security, reliability, and resilience in ways that are kind of inconvenient. But uh, you know, I, I want to be real. When, when I talk to clients who are like in financial services uh, or insurance, and they want you to file a risk assessment, and you have to say, "Well, it'll stop working if you know 50,000 hits come in on the site," you know, they'll be like, "Well, there's no way we're rolling it out." So. Those, those are important considerations for me. They may not be for all of you guys, but I always think about that first. The inflow APIs, uh, which are webhooks, and uh, the, the velocity API, those are pretty good at moderate scale. I mean, velocity uh, executes every time you send an email in Marketo, even if you don't have a velocity token, by the way. I don't know if you guys knew that. Velocity is Marketo's engine for assembling emails. So we know it's running all the time. You can overwhelm it if you pump a lot of stuff. Too, the code is too complex. But So I'd even say that it's kind of like high scale. You know, uh, rather than moderate, but I'm being um, a, a little conservative here. And then Munchkin API, um, or I'm sorry, the uh, Webhook API, which is also an inflow API. And, yeah, let's say give or take, depending on your instance, maybe 150 to 150,000 executions per day, which, by the way, is still beyond what you get with the other APIs. So that's why I think of it as scalable. Um, again, if you use bulk in as bulk, like your spreadsheet, your CSV actually has a million rows in it. Then it's awesomely efficient. If you upload a spreadsheet that has one row in it, you've kind of, or a million, you try to upload, you know, a million sheets that has one that have one row each. Not going to happen. So it really depends on how bulky your data truly is when you use the bulk APIs. Um, 
same really kind of goes for even the download. You know, the more downloads you do, the more individual downloads you do, the less efficient it is. You want to get everything at once or send everything at once. Um, custom object API is really the same idea. Bulkify, bulkify, bulkify. One of the things that I see, uh, well, asset API, what I'm mentioning here is really that if you're, like, let's say using the asset API to update uh, landing pages and templates and stuff like that. Um, well, what if your work group has like 25 people and they're all hitting save all the time and each time you're trying to execute one of these API calls, you're gonna run out of calls. You might think about that way, but I don't think about how many times your you know, sheets or docs or whatever auto-save over the course of the day. And if you're, every time you do that, if you're using the asset API to flush that, that's why I say if you don't flush it too often to Marketo, it can be efficient. Otherwise, I'd be a little wary of a big work group. And that's kind of why I think no one's really built this yet. I think they're thinking, you go to an enterprise and you say, update, you know, you, it integrates with Photoshop or integrates with InDesign. That's, 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 I don't know if it does. InDesign still exists? Yes. I don't code it, that's how I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, so if someone said, like, all of your changes will be immediately flushed as soon as you hit save in InDesign, that's not going to work with the asset API. But, you know, every hour, on the other hand, could, could work fine. Um, oh, I added old API. The SOAP API is the old API, and we don't really need to worry about that today, but if anyone has questions afterwards, um, let's do it. Terminology, I don't know, APIs and endpoints, because uh, sometimes it can be confusing. Sometimes we're using the API, or using API. Um, what do they mean? I'd say that the API is a collection that's really the same object or feature, the lead API, um, uh, you know, or the company API, and access using the same protocol, meaning REST or SOAP, like those would be two different APIs. Other people have different terminology, but that, that's the way it is. And then the endpoint is a function like delete, read, uh, you know, update, create. Those are the individual function endpoints within the API. So often when somebody says, I'm using the API, why isn't it working? I say, what endpoint? Because like you're already off on the wrong foot if you just say, I'm using the API. Uh, oh, that was my example. The upsert lead, which is the old-ish lead.json REST API endpoint, and the push lead. Does anyone use push lead? Good. It is. Uh, it's kind of better, but they exist side by side and seemingly do much of the same thing, but they're different endpoints. You can call them both lead REST API integration, but they do different, slightly different things. Uh, yeah. So here's an example of some problems with integrations that when you're building an integration, you might find it kind of looks like you can do everything you want, but not from one API or one function. So as I gave the example, I'm reading, transcribing myself here, um, webhooks can read and update data in a flow, but they never get custom object that access. So they can't do that. Velocity can read custom objects, but sort of can't, unless you do something really cool, write the custom objects back to the lead. So it's like they're shared, they're all, each of them is almost doing what you might want if you want full control over custom object writing, right? And then you've got the REST custom object API, which does all those things, but you need a separate system to run it. And it may have a whole problem with scaling, depending on how many updates you need. So I think this is a, this kind of encapsulates well. You can have, um, you know, there's no magic bullet within the known published APIs, things that almost do what you want. Now, of course, if you, when you can, you want to stack the different APIs to come up with your final solution. So, you mentioned recapture. Recapture consists of a forms JavaScript, a uh, little snippet of forms JavaScript that runs in the browser together with a webhook. That with e without either one of those, you're not going to get recapture working, but with them both, you can mostly do. Uh, once you get into webhook, this is an example of how you can have, like if you have uh, numeric campaign IDs in your UTMs or in your URLs, you can simplify them or you know, make them friendly names. And you do that by passing the data into a webhook when it comes in. So it's a combination of the Munchkin logging and the webhook translating or updating like a last UTM that somebody used or something like that. If you ever want to create a custom object from a form fill out, something that people think would be really cool, right? Because otherwise you overwrite the data every time someone um, fills out a form, you can do that. I guess I could have added forms to JS there as well, but that would be a question of forms, posting, send the data to a webhook, then the webhook loops back in using the REST API to update the custom object or create the custom object. It works, but like there's no way you're going to get that from a single API because it's a matter of uh, combining those different approaches. And this is a little hint here to what I was mentioning before. 
Um, if you wanted to aggregate custom object data, now I think I'm allowed to say that I probably did this recently with the full approval of Marketo himself, so I think I'm allowed to say it. You can, um, you can aggregate custom object data, like a, you know, their, the most recent custom object or a list of all the custom objects they have and like their product interests or things like persona mapping, uh, but you have to do it in a pretty crazy way. You have to use velocity to call a web hook that then loops back in and uses the REST API to aggregate the custom object fields back on the lead. I know it's boring, but if no one just said you can use the velocity use velocity to call a web hook. I guess I didn't do my zinger. That doesn't sound weird to you guys. Velocity can call a web hook. Velocity can pull in a map, right? Velocity can call a remote service while you're assembling an email and get like the latest temperature in the place that you're sending a person to. You guys are so jaded. Nobody knows the thing that is. So you learned you heard it here first. Supposedly velocity cannot do what I just said, but in reality it can. It can pull data from remote service into an email as it's being assembled, with the caveat that um, it takes a lot more horsepower to do that, because naturally you're connecting to like whatever, weather.com or some API while you're doing it, but that kind of thing, if done with triggered emails, is really, really cool. Um, yes, as I said, much more scalable. Um, so kind of APIs, Munching API is how you send visit web page and click link events that don't ordinarily get sent. And the forms API is how you extend the form to do different drop downs, validation, recapture, integrate recapture, submit listeners to do ROI pixels and stuff like that. So here's an annoying quiz with no cash prize today. Mm -hmm. But here's a so I said Munching API lets you fix missing hits. So this is like a button, clickable button. It doesn't log. A click link or or or, or a click link on a web page activity when you click it. This one doesn't. And this one doesn't. This one does. I'm not telling you they look exactly the same. Let's imagine they're on the same page. Clickable buttons. Anyone have any idea why only one of the four you know, possible buttons can do that? Yes. On the others, JavaScript and not. Uh, good question, but no, not in this case. Well, well actually, yes. that, it would be good enough to get their $25 gift card. Wow. It would be, but, but that's one of the cases. That, that they're not all that good. That's a really good call. Yes, if, if one of them were, uh, uh, what he means is if the button launches JavaScript and doesn't have like an href on it that goes to another page that's all script based, that it wouldn't be logged. That's a very good point. Actually, I should give you full credit, but anyone else have any ideas of what? Okay, so that's, that covers one of them. Let's say, let's say it's that. Um, no, not that. Thank you for trying. You would get the backup gift card because I. Uh, okay, like so. It's something to do with the code, right? Too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. I really I already sweat. No, 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 no. Uh, it is something to do with the code. Good, but I think he gets the prize. Um, so here's the the HTML markup that you might have reached one. This is a button with type equals button. This is a button with type equals submit. Perfectly legitimate and correct way to use the button tag in HTML, by the way. Correct, not crazy, but correct. The one, the A tag that looks like a button is the wrong way to do it, but it's the one that gets locked. Why is the Munchkin uh, library, when you load it on a page, the Munchkin library ignores Buttons. I don't know why, but it does. So even if you and I just was working on this with a client, they have this great product catalog. You, you download like a CAD diagram uh, by clicking a button, and they weren't getting their click button. And I kind of knew. Oh, great! You had a good web designer. They used the button, and then Munchkin ignores it. So that's why this happens. But um, your answer would definitely apply to this one, where you might have the the hash. Oh, right, because this is the third case. Um, see how the href is just the empty hashtag? Mm -hmm. Munchkin ignores any link that has an empty hashtag, which is a common way of, uh, let's say, the, just the pound sign or nothing. A common way to use JavaScript to power, I really should have given you more credit, I'm sorry, I didn't give you the full thumbs up, but it's just that was one of them. So, yeah, so, and again, 
This one maybe is not like the best practice. Was a perfectly reasonable and common practice for a web developer if you guys build pages like that, and yet it won't get blocked. You go crazy. You're in Marketo. Why? I know I clicked it. I see the other things. The Munchkin cookie is associated, but that's not being logged. This is the kind of crazy making stuff that you can fix um, by using the Munchkin API. And I won't linger on the code here because I do realize there aren't that many coders in the room. We can review it later. Uh, by the way, I, I mean I can hang out all night. If, and I will finish at some point. And I could, if anyone wants to like the big brains and code stuff later, right? anyway, if you want to do that. Um, yeah, so this is just like a quick function that you would do to redecorate, to use much concerns, to redecorate those buttons. So they work. Do you have a question? I'm forcing you to have a question. Anyway. Sorry. Um, and this is the kind of thing that I have to write all the time. I have a very weird job because, like, this is a weird specialty to have, right? But um, it comes from reverse engineering how Munchkin works. And if you are interested in doing that, and you want to move into a development career or change your level of coding skill, do this. Download the Fiddler web proxy, because if I didn't have that product on my, it's free. If I didn't, uh, and there's even a Mac version. Um, if I didn't have that on my machine, I wouldn't know any of this stuff. It's all about tracing over the last few years how Munchkin really operates. If you just wait, for the Munchkin activity to show up in the activity log, think about how crazy you will go waiting. That could be five minutes, and you open a support case, and they're like, that's fine, right? So if you really want to know what Munchkin is logging and what it's not logging, um, the web proxy that's installed on your machine is how you eavesdrop on what your browser is actually sending to the server. And as I said, the vast majority of my knowledge in this area, you cannot read this, but comes from using Fiddler. This is one, uh, a screenshot of my Fiddler setup on my home machine. If anyone can see it in the front row, you can see that I have it intercepting calls to visit web page, delaying calls to click link, um, dropping calls to associate lead, rewriting calls to the forms JavaScript library. And you may think that's crazy, but if things stop working and you can't explain it to the people upstairs, wherever they may be, this is how crazy things can get. And as I was just telling these guys, see, the Warren story. When I first started using Marketo, it was because I was working with a client on another project, not Marketo project, and Munchkin wasn't working. And I had to start doing this. This was like four years ago. So I kind of came into it from a very warped, strange angle. But if you don't, you know, maybe you don't have to do this, but you know, talk to your developer. Because until you have this kind of expertise in house, I think you can't really know what you're missing. And yes, Again, the Munchkin API is truly an API. It's labeled as such. The Forms JavaScript API, you've probably seen in many cases, is a way of integrating uh, all manner of external services, concepts, plugins, add-ons into, um, into Marketo Form. Here's a Marketo Form with a little auto-complete uh, thing in the product interest. Here's something that you'd have to be very detailed to know why you can't do this with regular Marketo. You need the Forms JavaScript API. Um, but having the date of birth placeholder in there is impossible unless you use the API. Here's a recaptcha, just a great example of, uh, of that. Um, so not just the visual enhancements like that with the JavaScript API, but fixing crazy stuff that doesn't work. Um, referral forms that don't work unless you manipulate cookies, which you have to do with the JavaScript API to get the right timing. Um, Embedded form prefill, which I published all the code to do that, and without the forms JavaScript API, you couldn't do it. Who's using my code? Someone, raise your hand. Yes, no I one? use. You? Okay. I use. Well, it has, sees a lot of international use. It's really big in <laughs> Japan and <in> France, <laughs> and I'm not even really lying, even though it's not big Japan. Yes, I know that. It, uh, but anyway, you can do embedded prefill, but you couldn't do that without the forms JavaScript API, yeah. because that's what makes the form programmable. Otherwise, it just sits there obeying. The default out of the box stuff. Um, uh, I'm going to skip a little bit here because I feel like maybe getting bogged down. But these are um, some of the rules and regulations you do in the JavaScript API. So if you were the coders in the room, these are some of the rules. And you look at the deck later, you can see how to, as I said, how to mess up a Marketo Forms integration is to not use the Forms JavaScript API, but still try to customize a Marketo form. You will fail. You will fail badly. You will not know that you failed sometimes because it will work in some browsers but not others. And that's one of the things that Forms JavaScript API is for, is making sure that it works the same in all browsers. Marketo Forms still work, I think, in IE8, some, at least some of, some of the features, and definitely in IE9. 
And when you start doing stuff that you only tested in your latest you know, Chrome 69, uh, it's not going to work. But if you use the Forms JavaScript API to build your solution, you are, within reason, guaranteed that it will continue to work. Um, yeah. Saying even if you use the Forms integration, there are things that you make sure you have to use the API in the right way. Um, Asynchronous tracking pixel, let's say it's a double click tracking pixel, adverse tracking pixel, whatever, um, loading in the on success. Anybody know why that doesn't work? Tracking pixel loading in the on success of a forms? No, but uh, it's because when you load a pixel asynchronously, as like the Google Analytics Library and other ones do, it's not guaranteed to finish before the page navigates away. So sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. The nightmare scenario for troubleshooting is people will say, I think we're getting half the conversions we should. And it's actually because based on random network conditions, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So you still have to do these things the right way. This is a so what's the solution thing. for that? The solution is with something like GA, for example, there's a, a callback method in GA called the hit callback. And you make sure that you wait for the tracker to fire its callback, and only in its callback do you change the location to the thank you URL. So you're, that's, that's waiting, it's serializing, or ensure, you know, ensuring they happen in order. The pixel loads, the ROI, the ad agency sees it, then the page redirects. Otherwise, um, it's effectively random. So this might be something of a rudimentary yeah. question, but when you're talking about any sort of form API, like yeah. the JavaScript API, this is a piece of code that you put within the embed code for the form. It could be on the landing page itself or in the embed code. It could be added to um, the form descriptor, which is what you see in the form editor. Okay. It could be added as I usually try to do it in a separate JavaScript file. But you can do it in, in any place, really. It could be like on the form itself, on the landing page itself, external JavaScript file. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, in back, you may think, what's that have to do with certain kinds of server integration? The form's endpoint is not the same as the form's JavaScript API. It's not officially documented, but very easy to see that it works and will always continue to work and officially is supported by Marketo. Um, uh, Unbounce is like my uh, nemesis. Because even though I like Unbounce's landing page, I don't know if anyone uses Unbounce here or things like it. Good! I like that. Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I don't know if you realize this, but if you use Unbounce's like you know Mar old Marketo logo, but still they're like advertised integration, the person who filled out the form doesn't have their Munchkin so uh, session associated with their lead, so you can't track their activities based on filling out the form. And that's because this is a classic example of like a fake integration where Unbounce has put the Marketo logo on there as if they understand how Marketo works, but Apparently, not once did they talk to a Marketo user to say, hey, is that working out for you? So the Marketo user would say, uh, I don't see anything in Marketo, so I don't know. What they do do is they create a lead, but they don't associate the Munchkin session, so you can't track what else they did, which could be very, very important going down the line. I believe HubSpot does it, but that is, like, we use it here, but that is my biggest annoyance is that you can't, right, you can't leave that up here. Where I have very good developers in the past that have put forms on outside of the group domain, on the main site, and still be able to input kind of mm -hmm. that. Cool. But it's annoying that Unbounce does not do that. Well, I'll tell you how you do it with Unbounce. You rip out their stupid broken integration that they won't fix, and you replace it with something else to give them credit. That sounded like a real spike with that. But if this didn't exist, then we couldn't do it. They actually have this really cool feature that for some reason they think is worse than using their broken integration, and it's actually better. You can use this as an uh, screenshot of my own. Um, you can use this option to post form data to a URL, post to your forms endpoint directly, and it works perfectly. It does everything that you expect an unbounced form to do with regards to Marketo integration, and guess what? You didn't click on the Marketo logo ever. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you can see maybe where some of my mistrust comes in. That's why I see the Marketo logo, the first thing I think is that these people really know Marketo. Like, if you're using the logo, you know, maybe it's 50-50 that you understand. Uh, integration is using, you can ask me more about that, how I set that up in the day, if you guys want to know that anymore. It's very, it takes two seconds. Uh, for some reason, I never documented it. The um, webhook APIs. Webhooks run when a lead runs through a smart campaign that has the call webhook. Uh, Instruction, very simple. 
Most of that, all that load, also that load in the context of that need can pass all of these fields and my tokens as well, company tokens, uh, program tokens, campaign tokens, and anything else in the context of where that lead is passing through the smart campaign. So webhooks are really good for, uh, let me go back to this in one second, um, really good for doing things like sending data, calculating new fields based on that data, normalizing it, you know, capitalization, uh, phone number formatting, anything like that is going to be a webhook because it happens in the context of one lead one lead at a time, and the values get written right back to Marketo as a result. You can do, uh, who uses an event registration cap solution or wishes they have? Zero? Zero people, you can use one. I know you can, then you can. Okay, good. What do you use for that? Is that okay? Yeah, like within Marketo, the uh, call event to do. Yeah. So, um, you can use you can use a webhook um, to call to a central server that maintains a count for every program, every campaign, every event, every webinar, whatever. And that count can be governed by like a my token that's called maximum event registrants or something like that. Um, without a webhook, there's no way to do that in Marketo. There is a way to do it without an external service that I haven't done my post on yet. But but you still need a web, which might sound weird. You still, it's basically what they call back to market, in case that wasn't sort of between the lines. Um, but you do always need a web. You need to execute when somebody gets added to a program, they have a new program status, you send them out, they're registered for there, and you send them log that there's someone new in that program. Market doesn't let you do that. There's no such functionality. So that's where a web is perfect, especially because web hooks do have, like I said, you know, practically speaking, 50 to 150,000. Um, the maximum calls per day, and usually, unless you're a really, really successful company, you're not getting more than 150,000 people registering per day. So it's like it fits well within that limitation of the API, and it's just really, you know, magical to be able to lock down the landing page that says, sorry, this event is full, and, you know, send complete list of people and all kinds of stuff. But without the web book, without a web book, you can't do that. Um, and of course, you know, uh, command base or other stuff like that, whatever, to do uh, lookups. Um, Demographic, firmographic information, do that via webhook as well. Um, you can send data completely to other instances, perhaps even sending it to another Marketo instance, which people do. Um, and maybe in a sense, most important is the, well, not most important, but <laughs> equally important, is if something can be done via REST or via webhook, do it via webhook, because you only are going to get 50,000 uh, at most REST API calls to use across every single integration. So wouldn't it be better if you can do it either way to do it with the one that's more flexible and scalable? I think it is. It's things that webhooks can't do, um, despite their power, they can't create a new lead because they execute in the context of an existing lead and they enrich that lead's data or send that lead's data to a counter or to an enri enrichment service or something like that. So they can't create a new one, it's always the one that it's running. Um, like I said, practical limit, maybe about 50 to 150,000, depending on what else you're doing in your instance. Um, one I really hate is that they don't have any direct access to custom object data because you kind of think that they might because they can use my tokens and lead tokens, but they can't access opportunities and that it kills me. But if that's not what you mean to enrich on, then, then that's fine. Um, they are it's really much more cautious, asynchronous, which means the data update is not guaranteed to finish by the next step in the flow. You have a flow step that says call webhook you are not guaranteed to be able to execute the next step with the new data. So instead, you trigger on the data value change and when the data value is changed. Or the webhook is called trigger, which is another trigger related to that. What you don't do, I don't want to hear that you're doing that. I know that you do, but is use a wait step. Okay, I was just gonna ask him. No, 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 no. Well, because it's just random. So you don't really, I hate that. <laughs> Sorry. No, I appreciate it. it does usually work, but it's not guaranteed to work because you're not waiting for the data value to change. You're waiting a minute. Yes. Knows what happens. Whereas the data value change trigger is guaranteed to fire when that value that you're updating changes. Um, so anyway, that's my, I, I, I got away from that a long time ago. I think of wait steps as being, you want to make someone wait, you know, not make someone, have someone wait 48 hours before they get a follow-up email or seven days. That's what they're for. They're not for guessing that Marketo is done, you know, processing data. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. In the anyway, I'm just saying that's not what you, that's not what I, I would do. How about that, right? Um, 
terminology-wise, this is where things get a little bit weird. What's the webhook? Is it the remote service that the webhook definition in Marketo ends up calling? Or is it the act of setting up the definition in Marketo? Or the act of calling, putting the, I don't know. Yes? For your previous slide, I actually have used a to create a You can create a new lead, but it, it has to run in the context of an existing lead. You're right. That's I, I should have been precise. It can't. The webhook won't run without a lead. So that's a very good clarification. I appreciate that. Webhook cannot create a new lead unless you run it and you have it call an external service or use the forms endpoint of that you're using um, to create a new lead. But um, otherwise, it just sits there waiting to be executed. So that's what I meant. But I, I could probably clarify what I meant by that. Sometimes people do wonder. Uh, that they say, like, can I use a webhook to create a new lead from a certain form, that kind of thing? And be like, well, no, the lead already has to exist to run through the flow to call the webhook. But yes, good, good uh, counterpoint. People actually deliberately do that. I don't know if that's what you're doing to create duplicates. Like, it's deliberate, deliberate duplicate creation. Hmm? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so as to say, terminology wise, um, I don't know. Druggy, what you call it. It can be confusing. It's hard to communicate. People say, just write a webhook. What do you mean? Do you mean um, put the configuration in the webhook configuration definition? Or do you mean write the service? Or do you mean find the service that gets called? The reason it gets more, I just wanted to show you how focus works for a second. And I have some users here. Um, the reason that distinction gets a little confusing with flow groups, which is a webhook service, is that the webhook service lets you run JavaScript, and you put the JavaScript in the payload template in the admin block. So it can be kind of mind-bending if you're not an existing flow groups user to kind of see how it works. I know a few of you guys use it. And so it's like you're writing it, but it's not really running in Marketo. It's passing the code to an external service that's running the code and then passing the results back. But because it's a free form like authoring environment, you can do that in here. All kinds of crazy stuff, it's crazy JavaScript in there. And this is what I was kind of alluding to a moment ago. There is actually a way to do event registration mapping without flows using only Marketo. And it's totally crazy, but I'm going to write it out one of these things. But this is, this is a webhook definition I have for doing that um, using this crazy method. But, uh, but again, it's still a webhook because it's calling, well, spoiler alert. It's calling this Marketo landing page, in fact. So it's still going outside, kind of going back in to hit the landing page. So we'll see about that someday. Not today. Cool. Um, but I would love to be able to just have everyone using that, even though it's clumsy, because it means you don't, you know, it's like still, you don't have to subscribe to anything, it's not extra thing. Yeah, people talk about how to build a webhook. Do they mean it's really easy, or do they mean they know a little bit of PHP? Um, I'm not sure it's really that easy for the average person who's not a coder to write a webhook service. It's very easy for them to set up a webhook definition, and that's where that you know, communications barrier comes in. What did I mean? Did I mean go into the admin UI? That's easy. Well, sometimes you mean write the code on the back end. Um, I don't know. And also, you always need to have a place to run it. So it's kind of a hard, I don't know. And I don't really have an answer to whether for any given person using Webhooks um, that you uh, or building webhooks is, is a good idea. If you have a developer uh, in, your, in your group or someone you can reach out to, that is like cool, no problem. I'll write you a two-line webhook to fix updates, to fix up, um, you know, account registrants and um, all manner of other things. You know, capitalize first names, and that's fine. Otherwise, you, you could be kind of out, you know, left out to dry a little bit because people are going to tell you it's really easy, but no one built it for you. So. Um, Velocity, my favorite integration of all time. Really, it is. I'm saying that. So, Velocity runs when an email is assembled. It always runs in Marketo. Marketo always uses Velocity to assemble everything. Just keep that in mind. I said it before. It doesn't matter if you have a Velocity token, which is an email script token, in your email. Marketo is always running Velocity. It's one of the building blocks of the platform. And that's good, because it means you get a window into that. You get to use a lot more. That's why Velocity can do things like um, output custom objects um, and uh, sort and filter lists of stuff and look at the date fields on someone and project what seven days in the future is when you have like a coupon sale or, or something like that. Um, 
Velocity is at once tightly integrated, and also there it is an abstraction, like I was saying ages ago, about what an API is. It's an abstraction. You don't have direct access to the database, but you have access to all of the fields, and you have Java. And Java is like the most powerful language in the world. Not JavaScript, which is plenty powerful these days as well. Um, if you want to get freaked out, you know what I said, don't freak out. This is, for example, a page from the Java 6 specification on Oracle that now owns Java. This is just one page of that. So somebody said the other day on the community, um, I, you know, I kind of like email script tokens, but I wish Marketo would replace velocity with something, what did uh, one person say, like more robust? Which I didn't even, I think I did let that thread go. But I thought it was really crazy because there was nothing more robust that you could possibly have as a scripting language for assembling emails than Velocity. Again, Marketo themselves use Velocity, but you can also use Velocity to do all kinds of crazy math and generating hashes and security and assembling lists, and it's just insane. So it was really weird to say that it wasn't robust. I think what they meant, none too ironically, was it's not easy. And that is true. It is not easy, but it's very robust. So here are some ideas. Localizing output, if you have the lead's preferred language um, and the country, you do that. You can use a whole lookup table of all kinds of product catalogs. You can do crazy stuff with product catalogs, storing velocity, um, and, and figuring out sales reps for regions. And all matter of matching that you might be thinking, maybe you would have used the webhook for that, which is also possible, but velocity is way more efficient. So rather than calling out to a webhook service to um, look up what rep represents a certain you know, uh, geographic area, you could potentially do it all in velocity, and way faster. Um, and, and, and more efficient. Um, custom objects and emails is, I think, just so powerful. And that's opportunities and Salesforce custom objects as well as Marketo custom objects. So it's everything. Velocity has the sort of the richest access to the Marketo uh, back end. Again, not directly because it's an abstraction, but the richest access to all that stuff, anything. Um, daytime stuff. Um, I love it. I don't know. It took me a while to figure out how to do it, so that's why I like it so much. You got, uh, yeah, time to go. What, that's it? You're done? I'm done? I know, 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> you don't even know. No. Yeah, I'll be done in 10 minutes. Don't. Maybe even eight. I mean, we're, we're running to like 7.30, so okay. if you can give me a couple of minutes to close. Yeah, no, of course, of course. I was just kidding. I like it that I thought you were going to stop. I knew it was 10 minutes. No, it wasn't stop. It's 10 minutes. I know, I know. I, I was willfully I was <laughs> misinterpreting it. Because I may be done. I may be, I, my voice may be. <laughs> Uh, anyway, upcoming events, special offers, yeah, all kinds of things. Segmentation. You ever want to segment based on what segment someone is in in multiple segmentations so that content is based on a matrix of the different segments they're in? There is no way to do that other than velocity. And in velocity, it's very simple. You just